Um, large language models, I guess, since November or end of last year, they don't really need a long introduction. I think even people without any technical background are now very much aware of their existence. Um, I most strikingly feel that um, that in a context that I'm quite often caught up talking about this topic now, even outside of my work, which was never the case before. Before it was always like um, something niche and nerdy around language and computers, but now suddenly everyone is interested in it. Um, but yeah, anecdotes aside, we all played around with large language models. We use ChatGPT or BART to query for Ruby recommendations, to uh, draft emails, some seek even information. For me personally, the most interesting and useful use case as for now is uh, large language models in the context of um, coding assistance, as it makes you much more productive. Um, another hype topic is in the context of personalization, for example, in the context of tutoring systems. But the list is endless, and I think this is really a testimony to how much this technology has matured um, to great practicality and utility. It's also um, very much highlighting how big of a topic it is and how difficult it is to talk about this for only one hour. Um, I tried my best to boil it down to a few subtopics here. Um, it's a lot still, um, so I would suggest we do questions after the talk and I will try to make some space. And if there's no space left, then catch me in the more informal settings in a, in a poster session or so on. Um, or something like this, and, and we can, can discuss at um, that point. But yeah, so my talk is um, divided into three parts. So we have first a part about uh, the LLM pipeline in general. So here I'm talking about mainly everything that happens after free training. Then I have a section on data and evaluation. And then I will end with two research topics I find currently quite interesting. One is um, factuality in updating large language models, and the other one is tool use. Uh, obviously, there's much more we can talk about, but these were just two ones I cherry picked because I'm excited about them right now. But yeah, let's first give a bit of a um, rather vague definition of what are large language models, because I think there is a bit of a subjectivity around it. Um, I would say large language models are large transformer-based pre-trained models to predict the next token or word in a document. Um, now, large is vague, and I think people associate different models with large language models. Some call only these enormous models of the order of, I guess, hundreds of billions. The sky is the limit. Uh, large language models. Some even still refer to BERT and ELMO, so the early models uh, to large language models. I'm going um, with a, a definition in between. So um, I would say, let's call for the sake of this talk, large language models, everything after GPT-2 onwards, so order 1.5 billion and above. But I do want to acknowledge that this is something that is changing and uh, I think it's changing towards larger and larger models, but for now, I think um, this is this fine. Yeah, here I will highlight, uh, I'm highlighting some of the open source models because I think specifically for people coming from acab um, academic backgrounds, these are the most interesting. And also, side note, this list is obviously not complete. Um, this is just to show you we have this jungle of, of models and it's hard to, to keep track. And in the beginning here, I want to start by explaining you why I draw that line uh, around GPT-2 onwards, and I'm not talking uh, about BERT and, and ELMO much, because I think at around that time, we had a paradigm shift in, in how we see these models. So in the at the time of BERT and ELMO, uh, we trained multiple specialist models, so yes, we had one core model that was trained in an unsupervised fashion, but then to adapt them to a downstream task, we always had to continually train um, and create multiple copies of the same, same model. But now as these models really scaled in size and were trained on more and more data, um, we are turning to more generalist models. So these models inherently are able to solve 
many, many tasks at once. So now instead of training multiple copies, we can on the spot turn a pre-trained language model just by showing a few examples into a Q&A model or into a translation model, whatever we are interested in. And that's not to say that uh, fine tuning is not a thing anymore. Obviously, we still need fine tuning, and um, I'm going to talk more about that later. Um, and here, this is the what I'm highlighting here in red is what I'm going to focus on a bit more because this is a crucial phase of of um, adapting the language model actually to enable user interaction and actual communication. Because before, when we pre-train the language model. Um, it might be good in generating natural sounding language, but it's not necessarily good in communicating with us as a, as a user. Um, Jörg Goldberg gave a nice example here, which I'm just going to um, use to illustrate this. So when you think about um, prompting a pre-trained language model with a question, it might be very natural to continue that question by just following up with more questions or by pointing out that this is a valid question in some context. Uh, but it's not necessarily guaranteed that the model will actually answer the question. And this is why this fine tuning phase is quite crucial. We do need a way of adapting uh, the model to our use case of communication. Um, yeah, I've talked about prompting or I've mentioned prompting now before. Let me also formally define this. So let's say a prompt is now anything we can give to a language model. Um, it's composed of instructions, then potentially a few short samples illustrating how the task should look like. We have the output indicator, and then from there we let the model generate. And in this case here, it would translate from English to French. Now, prompting um, right after pre-training might be problematic because um, what we see is that the language model is quite um, sensitive to small alternations in the input. So for example, we um, could just change the textual description or the choice of samples or even the order of samples and suddenly the model works or it doesn't work. So even some sometimes non-semantic changes affect predictions and that should obviously not be the case. So here on the top, I'm highlighting a paper that points this out. Um, what these authors did is they took some NLP task, it doesn't really matter what it is, um, and tested for it in a few shot setting. And um, they, alter, um, they permutated all these possible combinations of uh, four samples you could give to the model and then measured performance. And they measure mean performance across different model sizes, but they also measure uh, variation. And when you look at the 170 billion model here on the on the um, far, I guess, yeah, right from your side, um, you see how much of a performance difference we can have. It's around 84% to 55, and it just is simply not acceptable. Now, I would argue that in the case of um, changing the order of inputs, this is actually a bug. But one can also argue that in some settings, this might be a feature and it actually opened up a whole research space which we call prompt engineering because it gives us a handle to interact with the model and modify our prompts in a way that we actually um, harvest them to their full potential which uh, so we are able to extract capabilities which we weren't able even aware of just because we, we didn't optimize our prompts if you're interested in this whole research area around prompting um, here is a research uh, a survey paper I'm, I'm linking, uh, which was also recently updated, so it's worth checking out. Now, let me talk um, or highlight one very famous uh, such work around prompt engineering, uh, which is called chain of thought prompting. And um, this is quite a, quite a nice um, work where uh, also show how simple it can be to and, and, and just with some clever clever tricks you can harvest much more of, of the knowledge models capture inside uh, inside their parameters and excel at the task. So um, what we see here are uh, Q and A pairs, and usually in the few shot setting you would just give these Q and A pairs and let the model 
um, answer. Now, the problem is I can't read this myself here because it's super small and I can't read this here either. I don't know if there is a way of seeing the slides bigger so that I can actually read <laughs> what is on there. I'm sorry. Um, but it's essentially a reasoning task where um, I guess you all know them from high school. You are tasked to track the number of balls in a, in a basket and something happens to them. Yes, that's better. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, the question reads as follows. A juggler can ha uh, juggle 16 balls. Half of the balls are golf balls and um, half of these golf balls are blue. How many blue golf balls are there? And just like that, the model would say eight in the case of few shot prompting. Now, um, what also thought about this also thought about is how would a human actually approach this task? We wouldn't do a single forward pass through that that um, prompt, but we would go back to the question, split it up, um, and solve it in multiple steps. And this is what they then try to simulate. So what you see here is that now instead of just giving question answer pairs in a prompt, we have annotated reasoning processes. So here on the top right, you see now it's not only the answer is 11 for that specific question, but you see the steps the human took to derive that answer. And if we give that as a prompt to the large language model, it picks up how to solve these tasks and suddenly instead of answering eight, it answers 11. Now, this is obviously very useful in arithmetic questions, but it's also very useful in general for common sense questions where we do need to maybe think a bit about the question um, in multiple choice settings. We need to maybe weigh different answer choices against each other and we are by chain of thought prompting, triggering the model to actually spell this out and uh, by doing so it, it improves performance. Now one can always take this a step farther. Um, a follow-up paper, which is quite fun, but also a bit frustrating to be honest, is um, the following here, uh, where they turned um, chain of thought prompting into a zero shot setting. Now, instead of giving these annotated reasoning processes, they just add um, a context saying, let's think step by step. And just that sentence triggered the model to essentially do something very similar and, and answer this question correctly. And I said it's a bit frustrating because it's for, for us researchers, um, it feels like, a, like magic and it's like playing around and, and, and um, uh, hard to, to predict when it works and when it doesn't work. So um, that can feel sometimes a bit frustrating, I guess. Um, yeah, the nice thing about prompting is that this is something you can get hands-on started right away. Um, even with less compute, obviously not with these large, large models, with these enormous models, but smaller sized open source models um, are um, possible to explore uh, on, a, on a single GPU. Now, I mentioned earlier um, that fine tuning is not off the table, specifically when you think about these robustness problems, I think we really need to uh, tune to, to get rid of them. So there is still, before we actually prompt the model, the space of fine tuning. And fine tuning is um, here to make the model robuster. We can also adapt to new domains. Um, we can tune for a specific task, or we can incorporate human preferences in the context of us as a user using it for communication. Um, and another interesting aspect here is that we can update it over time. The standard way here would be we could just continuously pre-train, um, and that would obviously be very expensive. So I want to highlight what might be interesting, again, in the academic setting is that there's work on making this more efficient. So there are parameter efficient fine tuning techniques, which I'm just going to name drop here, and I'm linking the papers for you to check out. This is uh, something that should enable you also with less compute to um, actually work with some of the smaller models. Then um, another very interesting fine tuning method, which uh, was proposed, um, uh, I guess, a bit back now, is called instruction tuning. So here the idea is that we um, are not only showing specific examples and an instruction to the task, 
but um, we actually train the model in a way that it understands to follow instructions and then can generalize to unseen tasks. So what the authors did is they have a collection of tasks they train on where they have uh, crowdsourced a lot of uh, people to, um, to, to manually annotate task instructions and, and vary them. And then they test um, on a held out set of tasks and they're able to show that um, you can tune these models to, to follow instructions. So this gives us another way of, of um, tuning them to, to the tasks, so making them able to follow our instructions. Um, and just to show you how, how um, much of an effort these, these, uh, these efforts are to, to create such data sets um, and uh, how quick things are moving, in 2021, uh, the first iteration of this data set had 61 tasks. Now we are uh, dealing with over 1,600 tasks. So this was really a crowdsourced source effort of, of multiple labs. And uh, this is just something also very general, which is, I think, something we observe now in, in um, natural language processing, that more and more uh, collaborative work is needed and uh, a lot of labs come together to, to tackle, tackle research in, in the space of large language models. Now, one final uh, method I want to just briefly highlight is called RLHF, Reinforcement um, Learning from Human Feedback, as this is um, something that is talked about a lot uh, quite, quite recently. It's been around uh, outside of lang large language models before, but um, now it's uh, integrated into this fine-tuning phase of large language models. And the... I would just want to kind of give you a practical intuition of why this is interesting. Um, and I think it's best illustrated by um, thinking about how would you measure what makes a good summary. And here is how researchers from OpenAI would approach this. They would define different characteristics um, a good summary would have, clarity, style, and so on and so forth. Um, and now the question is, how would we teach the, the model to write a good summary? One approach would be to crowdsource humans to actually write a lot of gold standard summaries, but this is a lot of work. And uh, I think looking at these characteristics, there is no one right answer to it. So uh, it's it's quite challenging to, to do so. So instead we rely on humans comparing model generations and just rank them if they are better or worse. So if they are better, more concise, or um, uh, stylistically a better summary or, or not. And this is, and I'm now highlighting why this is practically useful. Not I'm not going to talk about the technicalities here, and I'm sure it's not really <laughs> practical from the technicality viewpoint, but it's practical in the sense of what do we want? We want to adapt them uh, we want to adapt our large language models to our human preferences. So first of all, I mentioned already, it's less expensive to have a human weight examples versus handcraft golden golden examples. Um, the other thing in this context, which is important, is that um, if we would have used humans to, to craft these, these gold standard uh, summaries, uh, we again run also when we train into the problem that there is no gold, gold answer. And in, in the supervised setting, we would um, penalize every token, every word individually, but some tokens should deviate and it's completely fine to have some, some alternation in, in different summaries, uh, but we would waste time in, in, in penalizing this. Um, so also that is a very practical um, advantage. The other thing is it gives us a way of providing um, negative feedback. So in the supervised setting, we only see positive examples, whereas here uh, we can compare um, to, to model generations and actually say this is a bad summary. And that means uh, it's a different kind of signal we can provide to the model. And finally, I think this is one of the most interesting um, aspects here is it's a way of teaching the model um, that it's sometimes better to refrain from answering, um, which is practically uh, easier to do with RLHF. 
because in a supervised setting, what we do is we always make the model generate, even if inside its parametric knowledge, it actually doesn't have the answer to, uh, to a question. Um, and if, if it should generalize well, it always is kind of uh, forced and triggered to always give, it, give an answer. So we, we never say that it's um, in supervised um, fine tuning that it's um, better to maybe sometimes say simply, I don't know. Whereas in RHF, it's easy to do this. Um, it's easy to, to, to give, provide that signal to a model. Because what we can do here is now we can show to a human on the one side the generation I don't know, and on the other hand, the generation of some infactual uh, completion. And now, now the human can say it's always better to say I don't know versus uh, contabulating something. And this signal is then something that the, the model can, can pick up. Um, but yeah, so this, this brief outline here is mainly based on a very great summary by, uh, or kind of um, explanation by Jörg Goldberg. I highly encourage you to, to check that out. Now moving on to the second part, data and evaluation. So here, I want to start now with, with data and mainly show you that in the beginning, when these large language models were explored, there was a lot of focus on scale. Um, and then people realized that we are not uh, scaling training data uh, in the same, at the same time and at the same rate. And people started wondering if that might be a problem. And indeed it is. So here, what... Um, people from DeepMind explored is um, in the context of the Chinchilla paper is that they trained a much, much smaller model than the state of the art models at that time, but instead they um, scaled up the training data uh, enormously. And what they found is actually that current state of the art models were heavily undertrained. So if you reduce the number of parameters, but instead uh, train longer on, on more, more data, you actually boost performance. So here you see on the bottom right how Chinchilla paper outperformed all of the other large language models that which were state of the art at that, that time. Um, this was now about importance of data in the context of pre-training. There's now a lot of focus on data for fine tuning. And a very recent paper um, that was um, debated a lot, I guess, uh, is called Lima by Uma uh, Levy and colleagues. And what they showed is, is quite, quite surprising in a sense. So they used a pretrained language model and then I think only thousand um, prompts, which they really handcrafted a lot. Say, I think they put a lot of effort into selecting these prompts. And then by doing so, they compared the performance of this Lima model with other um, state-of-the-art models, also including GPT-4. And here they show a human preference study. So kind of like in a setting of RHF, they have a human rate, which, which answer is better. And um, what you see is in uh, dark blue, uh, Lima is actually quite often um, winning um, also sometimes in uh, relation to GPT-4, which is quite surprising given it was only trained on thousand prompts. I do have to disclaim this data, uh, this, um, this paper is based on really small amounts of test data as well. So there's a big question mark around it still, but I think intuitively what makes sense is it does also make sense to spend a lot of time thinking about data quality and diversity and not only about scaling data. Uh, which brings me to another research paper I want to highlight here in this context, um, which is kind of a placeholder for a lot of work in, in that area, creative data generation techniques. So what people are now exploring is actually if we can um, generate data sets by relying on large language models. So what you can do is, or what these authors here did is, instead of using a large language model for a prediction, for solving a task, they turn the task around and let the model generate data. So they go from Wikipedia data, they select a passage and just mark uh, an answer to a hypothetical question. 
then they let the model generate the question um, and then it is followed by a heavy filtering stage where all of the nonsensical questions are filtered out but you end up with a um, data set which you then can use to to tune uh, models in the fine tuning stage and this is widely adapted also in, in um, other other contexts now two remarks on that i think um one needs to be very aware here of the signal to noise ratio because when we use a large language model to generate data sets obviously there will be also uh, all of the the problems large language models have might will be will be part of these data sets and there is a risk that these get amplified if we then keep on training on on these problems um so yes aggressive filtering is needed and then the second part thing i uh, which is interesting to think about is how does this work over time so we have a seed corpus which we use to teach the model to to generate data and the question is how far can we actually move away from that um how much control do we have in terms of shifting domains controlling how this data looks like um and then we don't want to end up training the model on things it is already aware of right so if the model generates things somehow it's already aware of that 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 knowledge and then we feed that back to the model so uh, it's interesting to see how how this will progress over time moving on i know we are <laughs> at great speed but it's not to cover to evaluation another one of these rather i would say hot topics right now it's interesting that people kind of i think move in the past it was a high focus on on a lot of people looked at modeling then people realized data is critical uh, people, a bunch of people move towards focus on, on data and now I think quite a lot of people are actually moving towards evaluation because I think one of the common common themes right now is that people really think evaluation is in crisis modus with large language models these days um, and I want to give you a bit of a brief overview of what kind of methods we use to evaluate large language models and I guess the standard one would be benchmarks so we have um, predefined test sets and um, they can be single task or now as we have these more generalist models, obviously we are also looking at more generalist collections of tasks um, and we have these annotations and we have the set data set and then we can evaluate the model. There are a lot of problems with current benchmarks. One um, big one is that models progress quite quickly and it's really hard to keep up with evaluation a good example here is the glue benchmark um, and it's uh, follow-up uh, super glue uh, both of them were maxed out within a year um, what i mean by that is here on the bottom unfortunately very small you see human level performance and above you see um, all of the large language models that apparently outperform humans um, I guess that would kind of indicate we are done, but we all know that this is not the case. It's just a problem. We are we need to come up with more and more um, uh, test sets. Another problem is um, potential data leakage, and this is a problem specifically right now uh, with these large models being trained on so much data. Um, one prominent example is in the GPT-4 tech report. You see that. Uh, authors mentioned that they weren't able to evaluate on the, the benchmark big bench because um, post hoc when they an analyzed their pre-training corpus they realized that parts of the data set were uh, in their pre-training so you weren't able to evaluate so yeah what i'm trying to say here is we need to rethink evaluation and obviously people are doing that and have been doing that for the few, last few years um, you need to move away from static evaluation to uh, more dynamic settings. One paper I want to highlight here is Dynabench, um, where authors integrated humans into the loop of evaluating large language models. So as models get better over time, humans can try to trick them. And um, it's a collaborate effort, collaborative effort in a sense that we can track all of um, our crowdsource effort in, in one, one benchmark and potentially have these moving moving data sets. Uh, another thing um, besides just not being static is we need to think more about our actual use cases. And before I think 
a lot of um, benchmarks were more focused on analysis or some specific tasks. And now the way we use large language models, that's actually quite different than from, from the past. We really use them for communication now. And that's what we need to incorporate in, in our testing. Um, and obviously that's again, something that authors do. So here I wanna hi highlight truthful Q&A, uh, which is a, a test where authors look into the generations of a, a large man language model and whether they um, pick up some um common fake news or um misconceptions you could find online because when they are trained on them there's a chance that they they are captured in in their parameters and these authors measures to what extent this is the case but more generally um i mentioned already we are now using large language models in a in a dialogue setting and um, there is a subfield of NLP existed for very long. It's about open dialogue modeling and people who've been working in that field, they are aware of that for, for a long time, that uh, it's simply very, very challenging to find metrics that work in this open domain, open dialogue setting, because there are many ways of saying something correct and there are many ways of saying something wrong and basing um evaluation on gold standard uh, crafted um answers is, is maybe impossible still i want to um, show you one of the um, benchmark uh, leaderboards that might again be interesting for you here because it's the open llm um, benchmark and what you see here is that llama based models are um, leading here all of the uh, top um top ranked models are derivatives of, of Lama, I think. And it's a collection of ARC. ARC is um, high school questions. Um, then Hel Hellerswerk is common sense inference. And then we have, again, um, test sets on uh, US history, law, uh, mathematics. And then we have truthful Q&A, which I mentioned. But yeah, we need to be realistic. Um, GPT-4 is outperforming all of these open open models these days. And this is really <laughs> something we need to keep in mind when designing these benchmarks. And something related here is um, uh, around what people would call emergent capabilities, which I, I wanna highlight because it's quite, quite an interesting uh, phenomena. So uh, when you compare small versus large models, something might happen in a sense that you maybe design a task which you think it's not possible to solve for, for your language model because you played around with a small model, but then you start evaluating a large model on it and suddenly you see this breaking point and, and you see actually, even in, this is now a few short um, um, evaluation, uh, there is suddenly a breaking point where the model picks up this task in, and is able to, to solve it in some way. And so it, it's really hard to anticipate what kind of capabilities these models actually ha have and then designing uh, appropriate um, test sets. Um, sometimes I feel like we are actually um, so much in lack of, of understanding of what's possible and it's not possible that um, I get that more on the side of looking at Twitter where people share their fun examples of failure and success modes of language models, um, which is, uh, I guess uh, on one side a bit, uh, a bit annoying, but also at least uh, it's, a, it's a way of, of getting, I guess, creative input in, in what kind of benchmarks can we, can we come up uh, next. Another thing here is also in the case of, uh, in the context of emergence is that prompting here is also a way of seeing kind of breaking points in, in behavior, which is quite interesting to, to uh, check out. But yeah. I mainly mentioned de defining these very static benchmarks is hard. So what kind of alternatives do we have? Right now, I think there's a lot of focus on human preference-based evaluation. And this would solve the problem in a sense that um, we can repeat this, um, we can be very subjective, and sometimes that is actually, uh, actually needed. Um, we can uh, evaluate generations holistically. Um, and the way we would do that is we would just 
um, instruct a model to wait an answer, we could say, is this a factual answer? Is this a safe answer? And so on and so forth. The downside to it is um, these, these processes take a lot of time and are really expensive. And it's really hard to standardize them in a way that we can compare um, different models um, created by, by different people. Um, regarding automation, what people are now exploring um, is replacing now the human in this preference study by a model, and they uh, query the model in the same way as, as a human. So now you wouldn't ask um, the human anymore whether something is factual or not. You would ask uh, um, a large language model. So we end up using now even large language models to evaluate large language models. Which is interesting. I think there's a lot of um, research that has to happen to to make that that work and and think of of potential pitfalls we we could end up in. Uh, but yeah, I think these are the main three uh, types of evaluation we are currently exploring: benchmarks, human preference, and model preference. Now let's briefly talk a bit about open open problems, um, and First of all, I want to talk about keeping um, language models factual and up to date, because this is something I am um, personally very much interested in. My, my research was also around um, factuality in some sense. And I think it's one of the main um, problems these, these models um, have right now. And non-factual can mean different things here, or there are different mechanisms of why a model can be non-factual. One is um, that it just confabulates or hallucinates um, answers to questions, which it just doesn't have any uh, knowledge captured implicitly. The other, and that's here shown on the, on the left, where um, we query a language model about, uh, I think, an actress and it just hallucinates some some additional information like um, that it, uh, she was also a producer. Um, another problem is that we do have non-factual information on the internet and these models um, internalize this as well. And that brings me here to, um, again, to truthful Q&A. So here are some examples of, of things that um, models potentially pick up um, just because they are trained on on internet data. Another aspect here is uh, time, and um, this is something yeah quite quite fun to think about because we train these models, and at least in the past, I think this is changing now. They remain static, and then I think even Bird. I mean, yes, I already argued it's not a large language model, but I think the the, the problem is still the same. Um, essentially, lives in the past people still download these models and deploy them in, in, in the, to their use case, but um, they might, for now, for example, not even know what COVID is. And I think we co <laughs> couldn't picture a world anymore where, where uh, someone doesn't, doesn't know what COVID is. But yes, our, some of our older language models um, lack, that, lack that knowledge, and this is important to, to explore. Um, here's a paper that highlights this, this problem. Uh, it's called the Mind the Gap paper. Um, and what you see here is different types of, let's say, knowledge. Um, so, for example, we test uh, performance on uh, proper nouns, on uh, nouns, on numbers, but also on um, verbs and so on and so forth. And you see how uh, the model behaves differently. Uh, if you test it across different time splits. And now here it's actually um, essentially error rate. So the, the, the higher the, the verse and the uh, blue graph here on top is, is about proper nouns. So you really see how, um, how severe uh, certain, certain words are affected by this, this uh, staleness problem. Um, and it makes sense that proper nouns are the most affected because these are the, the words that we keep on um, inventing, I, I guess, over time. So how can we update models? And now updating can mean updating to 
uh, update over time that also updates to um, counter non-factual generations. And I guess we, for now, have two main practical methods of, of going about this. Um, and they differ in terms of how much memory and compute they need. So the first one is, again, fine-tuning. Um, so we could just continuously train a model and um, ensure that the new data we show the model is, is up to date, but also more factual. So we maybe we uh, focus more on Wikipedia and less on, on, on Reddit in this fine-tuning phase. Um, but yeah, obviously, I highlighted it multiple times before that is uh, quite expensive. Uh, but it has the advantage that it consolidates all of the knowledge internally. On the other hand, we have uh, retrieval augmented language models. So here, we embed a large, uh, large language model into a larger system where it is able to interact with an external knowledge base or Wikipedia articles, something where we can control information. And then we um, have essentially uh, yeah, dense retrieval between the representation of our prompt or our current um, state of the dialogue. And then we can run a current end search with um, embeddings of our database and retrieve the most similar completion to, to where we are at right now in the generation process and integrate that external knowledge this way. Um, so here, the uh, positive side is that we have full control on that database. We can update it. It's very easy to update as we simply replace um, articles and, and um, keep, it, keep the, the database fresh. Um, it does require a lot of memory because you need to store somewhere this, this large, large index. Um, and the downside, I guess, is that we do not back integrate into the model, meaning that we will over time have more and more conflict between the internal knowledge of the model that is captured in the parameters versus the external knowledge part of, of our, our uh, database. And um, I think it's a very interesting research question actually to look at this, this conflict and figure out when to rely more on internal knowledge versus external knowledge and maybe how to, how to think that. Just as a side note, there's also one, one other method which is currently explored, which is called knowledge editing, where you try to um, specifically edit specific neurons associated with a fact. It's currently under exploration, so I wouldn't call it now, uh, as for now, uh, anything that is uh, practically uh, useful. Um, regarding retrieval augmented language models, an alternative to having this, this database is we could also just integrate them with a search engine. For example, um, I guess that's what um, this is happening uh, also on the side of ChatGPT uh, and, and Bing. Um, and that brings me to the last topic I want to talk about, which is tool use. And I think this is um, quite a, a, um, interesting and very practical uh, research topic in the context of large language models, because the question here is um, whether it's always necessary and useful to have really a single generalist model, or if there are use cases where it's better to actually outsource some, some capabilities, for example, to a calculator, because math is something um, which might be better uh, handled by something that is def definitely optimized to, to do mathematics, um, or even searching for factual information, so outsourcing to search engines. And um, this is, I think, how we humans would do it, right? We humans, when we communicate, quite often fall back to some of our tools and check what date it is, what time it is, calculate something, and so on and so forth. And there's a research question around how we can um, replicate this in the context of large language models. And uh, additionally here, something interesting is um, that this is a setting where we would have large language models interact actually now with the real world, which is interesting to explore. Um, I want to highlight here one paper, there are many, but this is one of the most famous ones, which is called Toolformer. And it brings together some of the things we talked about before. 
so let me briefly mention how these authors approached tool use in the context of large language models. So it combines few shot prompting and creative data generation in a, in a neat way. So what we give to the language model is a seed data set with some kind of prompts saying, please generate data where you call APIs. And we go one step back. The APIs here currently under expo uh, exploration are question answering, Wikipedia search, the calculator, calendar, and machine translation. Here, the sample is now about the Q&A system. And then we give some few short samples of how such interaction with this question answering API would look like. So for example, uh, when I would say Joe Biden was born in, me as a human would also not know where that is. I would maybe go to a question answering setting, query it, uh, where was, was he born? And then I would get as an output the answer. And this is now translated to natural language is the insertion of these special uh, tokens like Q and A and start of query, end of query, start of output, and so on and so forth. This is something the model then picks up uh, via few shot learning, and then it generates data that looks similar. So we can again follow this automatic data generation pipeline. We start with a data set in which we, via this few shot prompting, enable the model to integrate these API calls. Then we actually execute these API calls, or the authors executed the API call, and um, we retrieve the output. Now we obviously filter out all of the stuff that didn't work. I mean, some of the generations might not be legitimate API calls, but then we do additional filtering. We also filter out everything that is um, just giving random API calls in places where it's not actually useful. So it's not actually reducing the loss. So we measure whether uh, an API call in this specific place where the model just generated it is actually useful. All of the other stuff is also um, thrown out. And then we end up with a data set that is uh, clean enough to train a model on tool use and test on a, on a held out data set and see that this is um, yeah, functionable. So um, this is a way of of, uh, of, of teaching the model um, how to interact in a, in a rather controlled way so far with, with tools, but it's, I think, a, an exciting start. And I hope <laughs> that generating slides will maybe at some point be easier with the help of large language models. So next year, uh, let's, <laughs> let's be optimistic. And, and let's hope that large language models are, are making um, us even more productive also when it comes to generating talks. With this, I want to end. Um, I know it was a lot, so let me very briefly summarize what I talked about. So I talked about three things. Uh, in the context of the large language model pipeline, I focused on the life after pre-training. So here it was about um, methods of going from language modeling to communication. The second topic was around data evaluation, and I was trying to show you um, how much of a bottleneck that is right now and how much open questions we have specifically around evaluation these days. And then finally, um, I highlighted two uh, interesting research areas around factuality and tool use and the larger question around them, which I find very interesting, is that we are now moving from looking at large language models in isolation to seeing them as um, a component in a larger ecosystem. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see where, where this goes in the future. With that, uh, I don't know if you have time for questions. We do? Okay. <laughs>